Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 534, featuring an interview with Isaac Otway. Now he's the founder of Crimson Herring Studios, the developer of a game called Sovereign Syndicate. Now this is an interesting game because instead of using traditional dice that you get with most role-playing games, it uses a system based on tarot cards. It's also uh, a stews, uh, combat, uh, for something more of an adventure game style. Uh, it kind of reminds me of those, uh, uh, well, fighting adventure, fighting, uh, well, fighting fantasy books. Uh, there's lots of choices that you make, lots of role-playing, uh, but less uh, about combat than really getting into the story, the plot, the characters, in this uh, Victorian steampunk setting uh, that's really, really uh, super cool. Uh, anyway, we had a lot of stuff to talk about with him. We talked about, of course, uh, the stuff I just mentioned. We talked about uh, translating and localizing games for an international audience, uh, Steam and GOG and whatnot. Uh, the business side of the gaming industry, because as we'll see, Isaac does not come from inside the gaming industry. He's a <laughs> got his start in business and HR and a chef, and all kinds of other stuff, and you know, sort of recently getting into games. So I really like that outsider's perspective. Uh, and then, of course, uh, Sovereign Syndicate, how's it doing? Uh, what has he learned from this process? And what lessons can he impart to other independent game developers? Anyway, a lot of stuff to cover here. So without further ado, here is Isaac Atway. You know, you never know, doorbell. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I got, I'm trying try to get everything turned off. My phone's on silent. I turned off my Discord so it won't be just dinging away while we're talking. All sorts of little things. Those guys are so popular, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we're doing okay. Uh, right. Like it's 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 tough out there. But I mean, right, I, I'm really proud of what we did. Um, right. I'm I'm really glad that I did it. It's doing all right. You know, obviously you, you always wish you sold a little bit more, but uh, right, it's okay. Yeah, I just had Craig on, Craig Ritchie. Yeah. I'm friends with him, right? Yep. He kept telling me, man, have you talked to the sovereign syndicate? Have you played that? You know, do you know what that is? And you should talk to I. I'm like, no, I'm not really familiar with it, you know? And he's like, oh, man. <laughs> Here, I'm going to set you guys up. So he's like yeah. he's a big fan of yours. And I'm a big fan of his. And I'm a big fan of yours, too, now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, right. Getting... We we were uh, lucky enough to, to get to know each other just because we were making you know, similar games in a similar genre, had the same indie funding struggles and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, I can't remember how I reached out to him originally. I think we were just like, you know, retweeting each other's stuff on Twitter and then joined each other's discords. And then we met at Gamescom one year and just sort of right as we just sort of progressed in our game development careers, we just right kept an eye on each other and uh, right sort of supported each other. And you uh, right encourage one another when things get tough because it's right, it's it's hard out there. Yeah, I think he's, if I recall correctly, he's in South Africa. Is that right? Yeah, he's in Australia now. Oh, I think Australia. Australia. Oh, he's from yeah. South Africa, then he moved. Yeah, right. right. Oh, that's right. And then you're based in Canada, but you're originally from the U.S., right? No, no, I'm from uh, Vancouver, B.C. originally, uh, and I'm now in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. I did I did spend some time there in the U.S. I've done a, I've done a lot of work in the U.S., but uh, I've, I've lived in Canada most of my life. I should have read your... <laughs> about us page that's alone. all good so it's kind of a small world i suppose of yeah yeah right like there's you know i mean right think about all the you know indie rpgs that have come out in the last couple of years i mean right we even know the guys over at uh owlcat there that did like you know warhammer 40k road trader and i uh, know the guys that at 11 bit and fool's theory that did thaumaturge and and right we've got some bundles with them and and the guys at anshar publishing and uh game deck um so right we had some some summer sale bundles with them quite recently so yeah i mean right yeah we're all friends we all support one another one another we're all trying to do the same thing right uh make games that that we enjoy and that hopefully other people enjoy so that's really great stuff good to hear that i'm glad it's not a cutthroat <laughs> <laughs> no right like you know fashion each other you know that sort of environment right it's it's you know there's a lot of talk about that in the industry right so not so i don't have a traditional games background i come more from the traditional business administration side so i spent the last uh before i started my studio i spent probably 10 years in oil and gas in like accounting and finance and and uh human resources 
And so I bring the like the the business background and acumen. And, and so talking about the business of games and making sure we're making commercial products that hopefully sell well enough and, uh, you know, project management and, and uh, you know, obviously hiring and, and all that sort of stuff. But um, it's, the whole community has been super welcoming. Um, you're right. It's not really competitive, right? We can all win. It, it's not a binary choice, right? Like, you know, a lot of people will compare our game to Disco Elysium, rightfully so. It's a huge uh, influence for us. Big, big inspiration. It's a fantastic game. One of my favorites. Um, but everybody, you know, people who want to be negative will say, you know, why would I play this instead of Disco Elysium? It's like, you know, my answer is you can play both. I own both games, other people, right? Like I, I own all the, you know, RPGs that have come out in probably the last 10 years, right? Or even more than that, I'm I'm old now, right? right? Go, going back to write Arcanum and the original Fallout and, and uh, you know, all that sort of stuff, uh, right? You can, you can own and play all those. Like I, I love Disco Elysium, but I, I'm not playing it all the time, all the time, right? You play it through a few times and- oh, Bizarre, and some people think it's, I guess in some people's mind, you can't play both. It's just a yeah. choice between that stuff. What the heck is up with that? <laughs> yeah, right. Like I've got hundreds of games in my Steam library, right? I was playing uh, Bellatro just last night. Like that game's super fun. <laughs> I don't know why who would want to get stuck just playing one game when you have this huge variety. I mean, one of the things I like about your game too is that it, you're creating variety. You know, a new kind of experience, new settings. Uh, just something, something different, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. And, and um, thing. you know, I write, I, you know, I'm married with two kids. I'm in my early 40s. And, and uh, for a long time, I was working, I was working my day job while I was developing the game. It's only really this last year and a half that I've been full time at, at the studio. Um, right, we started back in 2020. And so I, we really spent like four years making this thing longer than we wanted, mostly because funding was so inconsistent. Um, right. If, if you just don't know where your next tranche of funding is going to come from to pay your team, you kind of put put it on the back burner for a while, work on it slowly. Right. I know that Craig at uh, Drop Air Bites there had a lot of the same feedback of like, right, we've been we've been very blessed and very lucky to get the funding that we did. Obviously, we worked hard to you know show a good product and all that sort of stuff. But um, uh, right. It just sort of uh, it just sort of is what it is. Right. Yeah, I see. It says. Uh... Over one million. Yeah, yeah, uh, Canadian, yeah. So I guess Canada is really serious about promoting the games industry. Yeah, yeah, Canada Media Fund is probably the best uh, government-funded game development fund in the world. Uh, so we're su right, right again, super lucky, super blessed to be here in Canada and to have their support. We wouldn't have been able to make the game without them, at least the game the way that it is today. Um, right. I think that's that's really the story of our development is I don't have a traditional games background. I started working on it um, on my own. Right. I had a story I wanted to tell. I'm a right a hobbyist science fiction writer. So I just started writing and then I was like, you know, like this would make a better video game than a book. It was COVID. I was playing a lot of these sorts of games. Right. The, the Shadowrun series is very near and dear to me. Um, and so I was just right. I, I wished that there were more games like this. And I was just like, well, right. You can be part of the problem or part of the solution. Uh, I can complain about it or I can get busy making one, put, put my money where my mouth is. So I did exactly that. Right. So I just took some personal money that I had. Right. Obviously, um, I was working at the time. It's COVID. We're in lockdown. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. You can't spend the money on the things that you would normally spend it on. And so I said, right, why don't I put this to good use, start a business employ some people who may be looking for work and give them the chance to utilize skills and work on something that they can be proud of, that we can all be proud of. And so we just got busy doing that. So, right, I put my HR skills to use, wrote some job descriptions, really spent probably six months just learning more about the games industry, watching GDC talks and, and reading, you know, articles and, and uh, you know, trying to get to know people and reaching out and, and you know, trying to have coffee virtually with people and just talk about the industry and uh, get to know some local game devs and just all sorts of stuff of just right spend six months doing my homework and then just really dived in and um, uh, you know really just had the intention that I would just use my own money to get the game made. Um, uh, I'm not independently wealthy 
And so we had a smaller scope in mind, right? Uh, initially, I wanted to do a game more like Shadowrun, uh, right? The mission-driven structure, the turn-based tactical combat, uh, right? All those games that came out, yeah, you know, 10 years ago from Hairbrain Schemes. And um, from, you know, not knowing how much a game costs to make, uh, right? I was sort of uh, naive in thinking, you know, okay, well, we'll just make a game like this. Well, it turns out that, right, a game like that these days probably has a budget in the, you know, low millions, um, right? Hairbrain Schemes, even their most recent project, um, the Lamplighters League, was probably a 20 million U.S. project, right? I think um, Paradox wrote down a good portion of, you know, 15, 20 million when that game came out and, and didn't do as well as they thought. And so... Um, thinking along those lines that, right, hey, I don't have millions of dollars, so what can we make that we can be proud of? Well, we can make a prototype, like a vertical slice, probably something more like Disco Elysium without the combat, um, just to take, right, to take all that technical work out that would be quite expensive to develop um, and just really build something that's more of a a tech demo for something that we want to do if we had if we got more funding and so okay let's build a vertical slice of what we want to make and then we'll take that and shop it to investors and publishers and and all that kind of stuff and and so we did that and uh we you know i i guess again naively so i thought we're making a good game here we've got some market traction we've got some people who like it and so we're going to get funded by a publisher and that didn't happen either um, right, we it, it was really surprising to me that even with Canada Media Fund funding, which came later, right? So we went and pitched publishers with our first demo back in probably late 2020, early 2021. We went and pitched that, you know, all the standard, you know, basically I just went on all the Steam pages for all the games I like looked up all their publishers and then went to their websites and pitched them. And, and right, we had some good meetings and uh, met with them. And all right, I learned more about how publishing works and, and, and the industry in general and that sort of thing. And um, uh, then we, but we, right, it was too early, right? Everybody wants to see more. They want to remove risk from their side. So, right, show us more. We really like, you know, the tarot card system. How is that going to work, right? We were still early in the ideation of how that whole system was going to function. Um, we were really going the old school, traditional isometric route. We were building everything in 3D, but then using like a orthographic camera to force a 2D isometric perspective. Um, and so they were, right, a lot of publishers were saying, hey, right, like art style looks cool, but the game looks kind of dated, like, can you do it in 3D and take advantage of things like verticality and depth of field and, you know, shadow and lighting work and all that sort of stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, actually, right. We're building, we're actually building everything in 3D. We just forced the orthographic perspective to just make it, um, make it look like the old school games that we all like. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't get a publisher. And so we went, okay, well, right. What other options do we have? We can go to Canada Media Fund, um, right? At, at, when I started, I didn't even know Canada Media Fund was a thing. We kind of learned that it was a thing as we went. Um, and and we, one of the, the challenges of Canada Media Fund is you can only pitch them every six months and you can only pitch them um, at whatever stage your project's at. So we pitched them on, uh, prototyping, which is like 250 grand Canadian. So, you know, call it 200 grand US. And the first time we pitched, we didn't get it. So we had to wait six more months to try again. And then we tried again and we got it. And so, okay, now we got 250 grand. Now we can answer a lot of those questions that publishers have had. We can put more development time into how is this tarot card system going to work? Uh, right, let's upgrade our version of Unity and and invest in the you know you know the the universal render pipeline and go back to 3D and really invest in like camera work and lighting and right really you know increase the graphic fidelity of the game and try and reassure some publishers that we know what we're doing right like we're also a brand new studio that's never made anything before and I think you know Craig probably had a lot of the same challenges of like publishers have a lot of choice in who they can sign for games. Um, uh, not only in terms of different levels of experience and different team sizes and stuff, but different costs of doing business. 
Um, right? Craig and I have studios that are based in Western countries where we pay our developers fairly healthy salaries from global standards, right? Um, publishers can sign games in Poland, Lithuania, the Ukraine, the Philippines, right? Developing countries where developer salaries are lower. And so, you know, if I'm pitching a publisher and I say I need $2 million um, or, or even a million dollars, if they can sign a game, a similar game in Poland for 250,000 or 500,000, all other things equal, why wouldn't they do that? And so, right, like that's, that's a lot of the struggle that we had was, it's, it's funny, I, you know, I often compare the decisions that we made to the decisions that Craig and the team at, at Broken Roads made they did a fantastic job of pitching the idea of the game they wanted to make. And the idea was so good that they got the publisher funding. We, we right, Australian Fallout, fantastic art style, turn-based combat, all the stuff, right? Like um, all the stuff that you would expect from a game like that, from those old school CRPGs, they pitched exactly that and the voiceover work on their trailers was fantastic and the art style was fantastic and the cinematics looked great. And like, right, they pitched the idea of the game they wanted to make before they had the funding secured, right? Right, you heard Craig say that like they got, you know, a hundred grand from Victoria Screen or whatever. And like, that's very helpful in prototyping uh, and getting a vertical slice and showing what you might be able to do with some more funding. And that's exactly what they did was they really swung for the fences and they got it. You're right, congratulations to them. They got funded, right? They got a publisher. They got enough funding to do the scope of game that they wanted, all the localizations that they wanted, the console ports that they wanted. Um, and so as a result, they were able to do their best to deliver the game that they wanted, right? You heard him say that, right? Obviously they they missed the boat in a few key areas there and, and they're right, working hard to fix that now. Whereas we, I, I took the tack of, if I don't get publisher funding, if I don't get CMF funding, I need to be able to deliver something that the studio can still be proud of that we can then leverage into our next game. And so I, I made key decisions like cutting out turn-based combat that made the game easier for us to make without any outside funding but also made it harder to attract outside funding. So, right, be, you know, all of all of the publishers we talked to, how are you handling combat? Well, we're gonna do these comic panels and, and right, we're not gonna do combat per se. It's gonna be like Disco Elysium does it or like Citizen Sleeper does it, right? There are, you know, a few, right? Game Deck is, a, is another good example of games that are CRPGs, but without the traditional turn-based or real-time with pause combat. It reminds me a lot of the click and fun adventure games of you know from the nineties. Yeah, yeah, right. It's it's a it's a you know a modern take on and right. Disco Elysium was probably the the trailblazer there. Um, uh, you know, although I right, I guess there are certainly games, Planescape Torment being you know probably one of the original ones where there is combat but it's not as key to the overall experience right what people really enjoy about that game is the narrative um and so i think disbelieving just leaned further in that way right like um planescape there there is combat but it's you know it's a lot of trash mobs and stuff that don't really affect the overall storyline what you're there for is the 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 dialogue right um and so so they leaned a lot further in that direction and so and we saw that and i think that games i mean even stuff like divinity original sin 2 have like story modes in them where like okay tactical turn-based combat is really important to our overall game experience but we understand that a lot of people are here for the story and they don't want the overly complicated spend two hours min maxing my character and my build and getting everything just right so that i can survive and have a viable build on the harder difficulties 
let me just sit back and sort of enjoy the story. And so that's just sort of where we leaned. I mean, right, like I say, I started the whole project because I was writing a book and I had a story I wanted to tell. And so um, I was really focused on the narrative and the characters and the setting and, and read all the inspirations as far as that went. Um, but in hindsight, it hurt our ability to attract that money that we wanted to make the game. And so, you know, we're going to publishers and pitching even after we got funding from Canada Media Fund, you know, I'm going to them saying development is fully funded. We got, you know, just over a million dollars US to make the game. It's 420,000 words and we want to do you know, uh, Chinese, Russian, German, Polish, Spanish, French. And, you know, that would probably cost how many, 500 grand. How many words did you say it was? 420,000. So, so apparently uh, the average novel has 85,000. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so how like, many novels is in the <laughs> So, right. I, I mean, you know, in, you know, I think Broken Roads is about the same word count, you know, three, four hundred thousand. Um, Shadowrun Dragonfall was our original inspiration. They're about three hundred thousand words. Disco Elysium's about one point two million. Um, so there's there's, you know, a healthy range there where um, we thought we were on. the, You know, once once you once the, the localizers do the repetition analysis and take out like right the names of the characters only need to be translated once, but they're in the game hundreds of times, right? So you don't, you, right? You can cut out some of that repetition work and get down to a more realistic number. I think the actual number, once you take out the repetition is more like 340,000, something like that. That's but- still, um, It's still a massive amount. It's still a lot of, it's still a lot. And so, um, right, it's probably, $60,000 US per language that we want to localize in, right? If we want the localizations professionally done, right? You might remember Craig talking about how um, when the game came out, it was obvious to a lot of the Russian and Chinese customers that the games were machine translated and not translated professionally by actual people. Um, and so that detracted from the quality of the translation. And when when the whole purpose of your game is the the, the narrative and storytelling, or when a significant part of the experience is that you don't want to cheap out on the localization, right? You want it well done because the quality is in the nuance of the storytelling. And so, um, we, so we, we went to publishers with that and we couldn't find somebody to fund it. Um, in part, I think, because we didn't have that turn-based combat, uh, right? We, we launched with 70,000 wish lists. That's a healthy number for a first time indie studio that doesn't have a publisher. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot of those wish lists are Russian customers, Chinese customers, Polish customers, German customers that won't play the game in English hmm. because they because they they aren't comfortable, you know, playing a game in English. They'd rather play it in their, you know, their their normal language. And so um, unfortunately, right, the game's doing okay, um, but not as well as we were hoping with, um, right, with 70,000 wish lists, um, right, you can see even the, the review count on the Steam page, although I'll say that we are selling more copies per review than average, right, we've sold probably 15,000 copies so far. That. Um, right. We just came out of summer sales. So I, I think that number is about right. Uh, right. We, you know, sold about a thousand copies during summer sale. Um, the game is well reviewed. Right. I think on on balance, right, you can see there are some positive and negative reviews there. I think on balance, the game has been fairly reviewed by Steam users and by the media. Um, mm -hmm. It's generally very positive. Uh, right. Our Metacritic scores, they're on the Steam page as well. I think. Um, right, we're critically um, an audience, uh, right, they, they reviewed us very well. Unfortunately, the audience isn't big enough because the game's not available in all those languages and on Xbox and PlayStation and all that kind of stuff. And so, right, so unfortunately, you know, the game's a modest 
a modest success, um, right? Not every game that comes out sells 15,000 copies in its first six months, certainly. Um, but we, we took on a significant chunk of debt to get this game made too. Um, and so unfortunately right now, uh, the, the game is not doing well enough to pay for both uh, the debt that we took on and for the studio to make the next one without more funding. And so that's we're sort of back in this publisher grind or investor grind of, okay, we need to go make a prototype. So that's what we're doing now is making, we've got a couple of smaller prototypes for just like fun little projects that we want to do. And then Sovereign Syndicate 2 is is one that we'd really like to do, but that's probably a two or $3 million game, right? Shadow run like turn-based combat, 20, 30 hours, you know, another 250, 300,000 word game, multiple languages, consoles and PC, better graphics, more cinematic dialogue. Like we, you know, we're swinging for the fences. I think what we learned from Craig and, and the team at Drop Bear Bites is pitch the game you want to make, not the game you think you can afford to make. <laughs> and, and if the idea is good enough and we think it is, and if it looks good enough and we think it does, somebody will come fund it. Now, obviously, also in the last few years, the whole funding ecosystem around the games industry has changed, right? If you've been around it at all, you know, you've heard about all the layoffs and studio closures and, uh, right, everything that's been going on with Embracer Group and, um, uh, interest rates changing, right? When we were first pitching, you know, interest rates are 2%. Now we're pitching and interest rates are closer to, you know, 5 7%. And so publishers who may have to borrow money or who, or, you know, or VC investors or really anybody who is looking to invest in the project has to look at return on investment. And so again, we come up against, right, is is a game this big in scope the right pitch is somebody going to come out with two or three million to do it we think so but right you never know until you go out there and um again we're competing against devs in developing countries who may be able to develop the game for less money or a similar game for less money and so if i'm a publisher i'm going geez, you know, do I want to give funding to Craig at Drop Air Bites or Isaac at Crimson Herring or, you know, uh, a U.S. developer, right? Look what look what Microsoft just did. They just closed, um, not just, it was a couple of months ago now, but they just closed a studio in Montreal, a studio in L.A. and a studio in Austin and opened a giant one in Warsaw. So they just said, you know, and a couple of those studios in the U.S. and in Canada were quite successful in their own right. But you can see they said it's more effective for us to close these studios in the U.S. and then to have Activision go open a big studio in Warsaw because labor in Warsaw is cheaper. Jeez. Yeah, I, Isaac, I, I can see already how your business background <laughs> gives you like, like terrific insights into this. You know, we talked about you mentioned Arcanum a while back and I was thinking about Tim Kaine and. He's got some great yeah. games, but he talks. I remember talking to him way back, and he talked about how hard it was to be a producer, and you got the creative types and may, may not fully understand all of the, the business side of it. But you know, at the end of the day, if you can't pay your bills, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I'm, and trouble you got to, you know, take care of that first and foremost, or everybody has to go home, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, right, uh. Tim, obviously his games are a big inspiration, right? I, I love Arcanum and, and right, the original Fallout. Um, his YouTube channel has been super informative, right? I'm a, I'm a subscriber and I watch his content quite often. Um, he's lucky that he has a more traditional games and coding background, right? Like he started as a programmer and got into the business side of production. Um, and he had that background in coding that he could lean on. Um, right. I'm I'm very blessed to have a very talented team. Right. We're we're lucky here in Edmonton that we have the the pedigree and the foundation that that groups like Bioware had. I was thinking and about so, Bioware. Yeah, that's another Canadian. Another yeah. Like and so so talk. right. So our so our team has worked on a lot of really great games. Right. Andre there 
uh, worked on The Long Dark from Hinterland. Uh, Scott worked on uh, Mass Effect, uh, the, the legendary edition, and right, he worked for EA Bioware, so he worked on like the Need for Speed series and Mass Effect and Plants vs. Zombies, and uh, right, he worked out in uh, Vancouver at EA's uh, campus there. Um, Nick uh, is a screenwriter by trade. Um, so brought right. He's a, a film, film, uh, film and television guy, published author. Um, Sheila came right out of school and joined us. Uh, but right has a very traditional like game design and 3D art and animation background and that sort of thing. Um, Tarek came out of uh, tabletop RPGs and concept art uh, and did uh, a bunch of tabletop games. He's in Switzerland, so he did a lot of like French tabletop in, in France and and uh, and and Switzerland. Uh, and then Ray has done a few different games project on on the audio side. So these this is my key team of people. We've got a few others too. I think at peak production we probably had two dozen of us that were working on the game. Um, you know my my lead uh, level um, 3D level designer um, and modeler worked on Cyberpunk 2077. Um, one of my other level designers worked on um, Dark Envoy that came out from Event Horizon quite recently. Um, uh, I had a guy who worked on um, the original Shadowrun rule books, did a lot of concept art for those. Oh, God. Uh, he, worked, he worked for That's Hasbro as well, doing like toy like design and stuff like that. Like it was a really, really eclectic team with really interesting backgrounds. I had a guy who was an animator and concept artist uh, for a Netflix series, uh, the the Dragon Prince. So just right, like film, television, video games, right? I, I tried to not be super rigid in who I hired because I don't have a traditional games background. Obviously, some of our folks needed that experience. Um, but I was willing to sort of look outside the box of I want people with the right character and the right skills and talent, but I'm willing to take a, you know, take a flyer on somebody who hasn't worked in games because neither have I. So, <laughs> right, right. So we, we figured it out. Yeah. I wonder, I, I love the idea of people that aren't from inside, you know, coming in and doing things. Cause that's where you get the innovative, innovative stuff. But, you know, I am curious, it's in a general picture, you know, cause you've worked in so many different kinds of industries, you know, what, what do you see as, as being unique about the game side it so from a from a purely business perspective there's a lot to like about it right it is global digital distribution and your and your product is for sale forever right so you so right so we have sold copies in a hundred cop countries around the world and that's from a business perspective getting on a platform like Steam, which is relatively easy to do and to get the exposure and audience that Steam can provide you, right? Steam is an excellent partner to have, right? Yes, we pay 30% um, of, of sales to Steam as a, right, a, a platform fee, but Steam also shows the game to more people than we could ever hope to, right? Mm -hmm. we, we were grinding for, for years putting up posts on Reddit and Twitter and running ads at, on Facebook and write all kinds of stuff for years, right? Going in all the digital festivals and going to PAX and going to Gamescom and write all that stuff for years to get those 70,000 wish lists. And then on launch day, Steam showed it to three times more people than we were able to in the three years before, uh, just because they're Steam and just because they have skin in the game of, Right. They own all of our game. They know what our game libraries are. They know what games we own, what games we play and what games we're likely to buy if they show them to us. And so, right, like, you know, look at at the bottom of the Steam pages, they've got the more like this section. And that's based on tags. That, so you write you tag your game with all the different category codes. So RPG, CRPG, story rich, uh, right, you know, uh, steampunk, right, whatever, whatever. Um, so and then do down at the at the bottom with is the the uh, down down more. I just uh, kind of surprised that there's a bundle here with Pathfinder. Yeah, 
Yeah, so we, you know, again, so right, we're friends with the folks at Anshar that did Game Deck, the folks at Alcat that did Pathfinder and uh, Warhammer 40k Road Trader. Um, uh, we just we just finished a bundle with uh, 11 bit uh, uh, and Fool's Theory on the Thaumaturge that did really well for us. Lots of audience overlap there. Thaumaturge is very similar to Sovereign Syndicate in terms of gameplay. It's such um, a idea to have these bundles. Uh, but yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it shows up on both Steam pages. But here's the the more like this section. So really, Steam is telling us that they think that all of these games and us have a lot of the same customers. And so when our game came out, I'm sure that Steam, I mean, I'm sure they have an algorithm and, and right, it's all programmed to do what it does. But really, it's going to, when the game comes out, they send an email out to everybody that has has it on their wish list, right? I'm sure you've gotten, you know, you probably get wish list emails every week, um, letting people know that it's on discount or that it just came out or whatever. Um, and they show it to all of the people who own these games and go, hey, we think these audiences have a lot of overlap that a lot of people who own these games would like your game. And so we're gonna show it to these people. And so, right, so they did. And so we got, you know, we went from 70,000 wish lists on launch day, which included being on popular upcoming for the week before, or like three or four days before. Um, I feel like Broken, Steam. Roads, Broken Roads should be on this. Yeah, yeah, I would think so. Um, right, and again, it's trying to show like the the games most like yours, oh. and um, okay. right, like I own I own most of these. Uh, right? <laughs> if they're out, I I own you know I think everything I've seen that's out. I know um, Esoteric Ab that's up there a little bit isn't out yet, but they're friends of ours too. Um, oh, which one is that? Uh, so uh, scroll down a little bit. There, Esoteric Ab the. Cartoony, yeah, yeah. So it's like a fantasy world, Disco Elysium like. Um, so these guys are in Sweden, good friends of ours. Um, we're anticipating their release. They're doing quite well in terms of right wish list and exposure. And I played the demo when it was in Steam Next Fest a while back. And um, or when when the demo went up, I'm not sure if they've been in Steam Next Fest yet. But like, it's I I really enjoyed it. It's fun. Um, so right, this is another one that I'm sure I'll buy when it comes out and I'm sure we'll bundle with at some point. And um, right, I'm sure we've got a lot of audience overlap and the game is just really fun. It's uh, it's Disco Elysium like, but built on, I think they use D&D, &D, uh, one of the open license ones. I can't remember what version it uses, but yeah. one of the open open license ones anyway. Yeah, Constitution Intelligence there. Yeah. Yeah, so right, there's there's... Lots of games coming out like ours, lots of games that are out like ours that Steam wants to show our game to. Um, and so Steam obviously has that process really dialed in, right? Like they know exactly what's going on and exactly who to show it to. And they can even use then data on who purchases it to know data on who's more likely to purchase it mm -hmm. um, based on differences in their Steam library, for example. I'm sure they probably do that sort of stuff. So so from a, <coughs> excuse me, so from a business perspective, having global di digital distribution and having a partner like Steam that is so dialed into helping you sell more copies of your game is great. Um, some of the challenges that come with the the video game industry are obviously there's a there's a degree of market saturation now where, you know, probably somewhere between 13 and 17,000 games are going to come out on Steam this year. Um, yeah, you're buying for thousand. attention. <laughs> Wait, how, how many? Yeah, so, right. I, I think 13,000 13, some odd games came out last year. So they're expecting yeah. right 10, 20 percent more games every year. So something like those are, would you say, are serious games? Oh, sure. So but... some of them are like hobbyist games. They're, you know, people's first games coming out of school or they're like, you know, school projects or whatever. Um, you know, probably three to 5,000 of those games are, you know, intentionally commercial projects that generate a reasonable level of income, um, right? Sovereign Syndicate is probably in the top 10% of games by revenue that have come out on Steam in 2024. Um, you know, that's awesome, but 
there's a big difference between us and Hell Divers 2 or something, right? Or Baldur's Gate 3 or, right? Like, you know, right? We're not playing in those ballparks, um, uh, right? So there are, you know, there are certainly challenges there. Getting funding is a challenge because there are, you're competing with, you know, it's global digital distribution. So you're, I'm not just competing with other Canadian studios. I'm competing with every studio around the world to get investment um, and to get attention from audiences. Um, there's a lot of upfront investment to make your game. Um, so, right, it's not like, um, right, so look at like a brick and mortar, like opening a restaurant or a liquor store or something, right? Um, you you make your investments and, and you open and, okay, you're not doing global digital distribution, um, but you you sell your inventory as you go and you can replenish it. And right there, there are businesses that you can get started for less money. Of course, we could have done a smaller game, certainly, or a different type of game, certainly, that would have cost less. But you really, other than early access, and even in early access, customers have a really high expectation of completion. Like your, your game should basically be done and then you're doing like balancing or it should have a really robust amount of content. Like, you know, Baldur's Gate 3 did like act one in early access. You know, Hades, the game's done. They're just doing balancing and adding different effects and things like that. Um, so you, you have to invest so much money up front before you even know if the game is gonna be a big success or not, right? Look at, you know, Broken Roads is a great example of that. Um, you know, I I don't know what their investment was, but I have to think it's more than ours because they were publisher funded, they're in eight languages and cross-platform on console. So, right, if I looked at what it would cost Sovereign Syndicate to do that, right? So Sovereign Syndicate cost one point. 5 million Canadian, so call it, you know, 1.2 million US to make. If we localized it into those eight languages, that's probably another 500 grand. And then if we uh, put it on consoles, that's probably another, I don't know, 50,000, something like that. So, right, what is that, like 2 million then, or close, right, like 1.7? Um, so, and then, right, you know, extra marketing expenses and stuff like that, right? Could we could we get the game out to more people for, you know, for 2 million if we did all the languages and all that sort of stuff? Absolutely. So, I have to think that their budget was at least that. And so you know, if they spent that or more, because they also did, remember, they also did turn-based combat and all that sort of stuff that we chose not to do. So I have to think their game's probably even more than that from a development perspective. Their their development probably cost more than ours. And their game came out and didn't do so well. So, right, you make all these investments in your game, right? Personally, yes, we got, you know, uh, a million and a half, or so from the CMF, a little under a million and a half Canadian, um, but they don't cover 100% of the costs, um, right? It's part of your contract with the Canada Media Fund that they only cover 75%. So I had to mortgage my house and borrow $400,000 Canadian to fund our portion of development to get the game made, uh, right? Uh, Canada Media Fund gave us about 1.1 million and, and we put up the other 400,000. Um, and so to make all of those investments and to think that you're on to something, right? We had 70,000 wish lists. We think we're on to something here. We think this is going to do okay, but you don't really know until those reviews start coming out, right? Like the, you know, our game came out on January 15th as a Monday. Our review embargo, so our keys were going out probably four weeks, maybe a little longer before because of Christmas and all that sort of stuff. We tried to get them out fairly early. But our review embargo was the Thursday before launch. So Thursday before, so Wednesday night before launch, I went to bed and knew that I was going to wake up to reviews. Oh, and man. I didn't get a lot of sleep that <laughs> night. 
because they can drop it. At you slept well that night. Right? They can they can drop at midnight, you know, 1201 Thursday morning. Oh. Um, right. And so to wake up on Thursday morning and see that PC Gamer gave us an 80 out of 100 was a huge weight off my shoulders. Mm. Um, that, right. That in general, the game reviewed very well because you're in you're in popular upcoming you're doing all your launch uh marketing pre-launch marketing and stuff your reviews are coming out people are hearing about your game this is right it's the most visibility your game is ever going to get is at launch and so if it doesn't review well if it doesn't perform well if the steam reviews aren't good at the beginning you really have a big uphill climb to recover from that, right? Look at what happened with Cyberpunk 2077 and even something on a on a smaller scale like Broken Roads yeah, where they made this huge upfront investment and then the game didn't review well, didn't perform up to their expectations. And so commercially, it's a flop and they got to go back to the drawing board and reinvest in it to fix it or just walk away from it, right? Obviously, the Broken Roads team has made the decision to, and their publisher, have made the decision to fix it, get it up to, uh, right, listen to the community feedback, get the things fixed that are broken, make the game, you know, whatever percentage better, and then, you know, hopefully the reviews turn around over time. But will they ever make back their development budget? I don't know. Maybe not. You know, will will I ever will will the, will Sovereign Syndicate make enough to pay back my mortgage? I don't know. <laughs> You've literally bet bet the house. You know, I, I was yeah. thinking of uh, Tim Kane too and Arcane. I mean, you know, you know, a lot of the same kind of issues with the, for, having to just get the product out. You know that you know they literally they're, we're not going to have the lights on. If we, yeah, well, right, like they were with. Product, um, and we realize it's got bugs, and we realize that you know. But I don't think you had any of those kinds of problems. But no, no, we were uh, very technically stable. Yeah, uh, we did a ton, any. a ton of QA. I probably in the in the five weeks before launch, I probably played the game two hundred and eighty hours. Like, right, like you're playing your own game a lot, a lot. And your whole team is playing, right? You're yeah. playing it a lot and you're picking the smallest stuff out because one of the big things that can really hurt you is somebody's playing it and there's a bug, right? If a, if a reviewer runs into a bug, a game breaking bug where they can't finish it or something bad, really bad happens, that's gonna influence their review. Um, right. That's what uh, Broken Roads ran into. They were originally going to release in November. So they had press keys out. All right. Craig, Craig talked about that when 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 you and he chatted was like they they put out the press keys and then pulled them because some of the feedback they were getting back was like, hey, this is pretty broken. Like, I can't I can't go here. I can't finish this. I had a crash like right, like whatever. So they pulled their keys and delayed their launch. Um so we knew, right, we, right, luckily we launched after them and we got to see that happen, right, as, as, as sad as I am, as disappointed as I am for that team, because, right, I'm friends with those folks over there. Um, um, as disappointing as that all was, my heart goes out to them. It was a very valuable learning experience for us mm. to see that happen. And to go, what can we learn from this? You know, we're, right? we saw the, the Thaumaturge came out and did quite well. Broken Roads came out and did quite poorly. And so we looked at both of those games, right? My, my market analysis and research hat, I put that on and go, what does this tell us about the market? Um, and so, yeah, like it's, uh, oh, Thaumaturge is super fun. If you haven't played, it's kind of like Disco Elysium, kind of like our game, like very narrative driven. It's very point and click heavy, but it has this turn-based combat. It's, you know, more minor uh, turn-based combat. It's not party-based, right? You control the one character, but like it's super fun. And obviously the graphic, you can see the graphic fidelity is like this is, 
for Sovereign Syndicate too, if we can hit this level of graphic fidelity, I'll be super happy with it. Um, just how much more cinematic they are with dialogue, um, the like facial rigging and animation and the voiceover work and all that sort of stuff. It's a beautiful game, super fun. I have to put this one on the queue. Yeah, and it's and it's obviously doing quite well, right? You can see their review count there is a lot higher than ours. Um, but it's also come out in all the different languages and they're backed by 11-bit studios. And um, right, you were talking about Tim Kaine there in Fallout and, and that story that he told, right? They were backed by Interplay, I think. And so again, right, like the publisher is making an investment decision about how much they're willing to spend on the game, right? How much do we, how many copies do we think it's going to sell? Obviously back then it was a whole different set of calculus because you're getting shelf space at Walmart and Costco and um, right. I remember seeing Arcanum and Fallout at Costco when I was yeah, a kid. Dude, I, saw, um, I got mine from Sam's Club. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I got I got mine from Costco. Um, uh, my parents bought it at Costco <laughs> for me. Um, the uh, right. And and so the publisher or the right, whoever's paying for it is making a decision uh, about how much they're willing to spend on it um, based on their analysis of, of w whether they think it's going to recoup or not. Sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong, um, right? Look at like Hooded Horse and Manor Lords. Obviously, that was a good bet. You know, they've sold a few million copies of that now. Good for them. Um, that's right. Obviously, that's paid off. Um, did Broken Roads pay off? Not yet. Is it going to? I don't know. Um, Sovereign Syndicate, has Sovereign Syndicate paid off yet? No. Is it going to? I hope so. Um, you know, particularly if we can get something like Sovereign Syndicate 2 out that reinvigorates Sovereign Syndicate 1 and gets more people to go check it out, maybe. Uh, right right now, so we took, we took the entire first month of uh, revenue and we got a grant from one of the Canadian export development uh, departments in the Canadian government, gave us a grant for export development. Um, we had to have a product that was that was in market in order to get that funding. So we had to release the game first and then go apply for the grant. Um, but between our first month sales and that grant, we can afford to do simplified Chinese, Russian, or essentially we can afford to do two languages. And we chose those two because those are the biggest markets other than English on Steam. Um, so we're going to do those two languages and console. So we're going to be, we're currently working on console certification and porting for Xbox, XS and Xbox One, PlayStation 4 and 5, Nintendo Switch, um, and Russian and simplified Chinese translation. Um, so that's a, a reinvestment decision that we made because the game came out, it was well reviewed, um, but it's not selling as well as we wanted because a lot of the people who would buy it can't, won't buy it because it's not in their language. And so we think that over time, that's a, a reasonable investment to make. And so that cost us 75 grand and right, the government put up the other 75. And uh, so right, we think that that is going to pay for itself. But we don't know for sure yet. So again, right, we we're kind of putting ourselves out on a limb going. I think it'd be tricky to translate this or localize it, given all of the slang. And, you know, it's very particular to the setting, which, which I, I love that, you know, <laughs> you know, I read, read a lot of Victorian literature in my day, you know, so it's a real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How well would that, you know, I'm just thinking if you wanted to. Like, how would you translate this into, say, chi uh, simplified Chinese without losing some of that? You so, know, yeah, so that's um, so you're exactly right. Um, right. I was I was very inspired. I love Victorian science fiction. Right. Oh, Jules, Jules Verne, Verne. Jules it's Verne, good. Charles Dickens, H.G. Wells, all that stuff. Um, right. Uh, even not not Victorian uh, in era, but like, you know, H.P. Lovecraft and all that sort of stuff, like all that, like. 18, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s sort of science fiction work is right. It, it's awesome. Um, and, and so part of what we wanted to do with Sovereign Syndicate was really give the dialogue, write a science fiction story that, OK, it's steampunk and it's, 
you know, minotaurs and, and, you know, fantasy setting. But what I really like about like, you know, uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells work is it, it feels very grounded in reality. Um, given some different decisions and different developments in technology, you could still see, right, they obviously did their homework from a scientific perspective to make sure that their fiction was reasonable in expectation, given the right other circumstances. Right. And, and so we tried to really be inspired by that and give our dialogue and world a real sense of place and lean into that more traditional science fiction, Victorian London feel, right? Um, ste steampunk has sometimes a bad reputation of being uh, really, you know, it, it steampunk sometimes ignores the harsh realities of what Victorian London was really like. It well, tends to gloss over. Game definitely doesn't do that. <laughs> right. So, right. So, right. So we tried to, uh, in context, what would a steampunk game with a more realistic Victorian London that was a very unequal society, a very harsh society for a lot of people, what would that really feel like? Um, and part of that, obviously, is the language and cadence of, you know, how they talk to each other. And, and so you're and so we were inspired by um pillars of eternity and how with their lore it, i i love those games particularly dead fire oh, um because it's turn-based <laughs> the um, um the 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 lore in that world is so dense uh and and, and so they have in their dialogue, like us, they have the, you can hover over the word that's, a, they use it for their lore words of like, oh, this is the name of a god for, you know, whatever, or the name of a place for whatever. Um, so that you don't have to go look it up. You can just hover right over it. And we love that. And I said, that's a perfect thing for us to do for our lore words, but also for our Victorian slang. Because we, right, we really did a lot of our homework into what that would you know, how, how to write that, but understanding that a lot of people weren't going to know what those words meant. We, we leaned into that mechanic. Um, and so we're sorry to go back to your, to your original question, working with a localizing firm is not just translation. If you're doing it right, it's versioning. So you're right. The, the more technical term is versioning because it's not just translation. In some ways, it's a rewriting mm. to be more uh, suitable for that cultural perspective and audience. So not just translating the game as is to simplified Chinese, but really looking at the content of the game and the words that you choose to use and the the lore words that you've made up and the general language and cadence of the game and having the 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 localizers work with our narrative team to in essence write the game more appropriately for a chinese or russian audience finding right so we used words that are grounded in in english history in, in London history to give context and space, uh, right, a, a feeling of place to the world that we were making. How do you do that in Russia? Do you, so we look into the history of modern day Russian words and find the equivalent Victorian era Russian words to use instead of using the, the Victorian era English words. Same with, Ch with Chinese. We go and we find the, you know, so we we do our homework into, okay, what's the modern day word that we're using here? Um, okay, what is the, so right, we chose the Victorian word here. What's the modern day equivalent? Okay, what's the simplified Chinese modern day equivalent? Now let's go back to the Victorian era and find out what that word would have been. And that's the word we'll use. Hmm. It so like? it's right. It's it's been a super interesting process for me as a writer to understand 
because I, I only read uh, and write in English. But again, understanding that, that the, there's so much nuance and beauty in what we've written. That's why I love writing. And so it, it does your game a disservice if you don't put the same care into your versioning, your translation of your work into those other languages because you they lose what makes your game good. Yeah, I wish I had, sometimes I wish I had more languages because you know, it'd be really interesting to see, you know, something like V for Vendetta pops into mind and like, what would that be? I'm sure that's been translated into God yeah. knows how many languages and, you know, would they, somebody reading that in Russian, you know, what would be there, you know, would it have the same kind of, the language have the same kind of impact, you know? Yeah, I think um, it's funny. I, I've tried to study other languages. It's it's tough for me because I'm not surrounded by people. Like, right, my social circle is predominantly English speaking. Um, and, and so it's so hard to lose a language when you don't have the chance to practice it. Right. They say the best way to learn one is to move there and yeah. you have to live it. Um, right. I've, I've tried to learn, uh, you know, French and Spanish and um, Japanese at, at different times in my life. And it's funny that it gives you insight into if you're talking with somebody in English whose first language is a language that you have tried to learn. I find that it gives me insight into why they speak English the way they do. Because it's like they're like they're direct translating in their head of like they in their head, they go, OK, in Spanish, that's this. And so I'm going to answer the but they use a they use a like a Spanish cadence or a French cadence. And so studying that other language helps you understand sometimes why they use words that they use, because in that language, that's maybe the more predominant word like in. In French. um they'll use the word ameliorate more than we will in English, right? To to fix something or to to uh, write to, yeah, right, uh, basically, right? To, to ameliorate is to write, improve, or fix something that's not right. Um, we use that word very rarely in English, but it's a very common word in French. Um, and so, especially in Canada, where you see a lot of, right, where we have a, a very large French-speaking population and where all of our government and even labeling on commercial goods is in French and English. You run into a lot of words in French or French French versions of documents that use words that you're like, right? Like you kind of grow up as a kid in Canada I reading. I, I mean, I grew up in Louisiana, so we have a lot, a lot yeah. of French speakers there too. So you're always coming across, you know, laying yap or something. something. <laughs> like yeah, I, I had to look that up. Oh, you don't know what that means. Um, but, oh, what was I? Oh, I was thinking for some reason too. I got a good friend from Iran, and it always uh, sticks sticks in my mind a story he told me that when he was growing up, he watched a lot of Star Trek uh, on TV. Uh, but it was always they had these uh, people that would dub all the characters, and they were they were sort of stars in their own right. Yeah. But he's like, you know, much later he's moved to the U.S. He's been speaking English forever, but he can't watch Star Trek in English because it just seems too. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's too off-putting. He's too familiar with with the the other thing. But uh, anyway, I wanted to come back to a couple things. Uh, one is the you talked about turn-based combat. Is that something that you had wanted to put in originally? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because so or, was, originally, yeah. we saw I my dream game to make is okay. Well, I'll I'll back up. I'll tell you that the 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 whole story is I was playing the Shadowrun series during COVID. I thought about making so so if you played those games, you'll know that they come with um, a like a user generated content engine that you can use in the Steam Workshop where you can build your own campaigns. Okay. And so I originally had thought I love the Shadowrun world. I played the Shadowrun like the the, the Super Nintendo Shadowrun game. I think I was like nine or 10 years old when that game came out. Probably still my favorite video game of all time. That really opened my eyes to RPGs. That and probably all the uh, Link to the Past on, on uh, Super Nintendo were like my first indoctrination into RPG games. And, and so 
I've always had a soft spot for Shadowrun games, and I have played those <laughs> those Hairbrain Scheme Shadowrun games to death. I like yep, that. that's exactly exactly. Yeah, that, that's the yeah, that's yeah. the Super Nintendo game. Um, so I have played all those games to death, and I I just wanted another Shadowrun game, and so they had this UGC engine, and I thought I'm gonna go make a Shadowrun UGC, and then I thought, well, I can't I can't sell that like right I can't make any money off of it right because I don't own the license to it. So if I'm if I'm really going to invest all this time and money into getting this made, I should probably go talk to somebody about whether or not I can just get the Shadowrun license and go make another Shadowrun game for real. Mm -hmm. Right. If I'm really going to be serious about this, that's what I should do. And so I messaged uh, Mitch Geidelman, who is the or uh, was at the time the CEO of Hairbrain Schemes. Um, that did the Shadowrun games, right? The the more recent series, right? Um, Returns and, Dra and Dragonfall in Hong Kong. Um, so I reached out to him on LinkedIn and just said, hey, right, I'm, I'm trying to start my own studio. I was hoping that I could license your, um, right, the Shadowrun engine that sits on top of Unity that you guys use to build the games. Uh, and that I can get the, right, and I, right, do you guys still have the the Shadowrun IP? Can I Can I license all that? And he got back to me and said, uh, right, thanks for reaching out. Um, we're owned by Paradox now. Paradox does not, not allow us to license out or sell any of our code or any of our IP. Um, and we don't actually own the IP for Shadowrun. That's owned by Microsoft because they did that first person shooter for the Xbox One back in like, what was that, 2007, something like that. It's this like first person shooter. So they own the they own the IP license for video games for Shadowrun. That IP is split. One company owns the tabletop and pen and paper rights, and one comp and Microsoft owns the the video game rights. Um, and so they um, and so he just said, "Hey, right, we don't own it. We had it for a period of you know ten years or three games or whatever. So we don't have it anymore. You would have to go to Microsoft and like." So, and right to be frank, like to be honest, you don't have a games background, you've never made a game before. And so like, you know, they gave us the IP because we've made Shadowrun games before. We started the IP originally, we were the original creators. We made the Super Nintendo game, we made the first person shooter game. And so like, right, like we, if you're gonna give the IP to somebody, you know, we're, we're a good fit. Um, you, you have to go pitch Microsoft and tell them why you deserve to go make it. So do you think you're in a good position to do that? Um, you know, you, you can, but are they even going to respond to you? I, I Right? Like, you're, you're welcome to, but like, right? Like, be realistic with yourself. Um, Very discouraged. And, and I just, right? And that's, you know, maybe harsh feedback, but probably realistic feedback of okay um right i never did pitch for it maybe i should have um but that's how i got started and so so hearing that feedback i went you know he's probably right um so i guess i'm on my own so i guess i should come up with my own story my own characters my own world that is something like shadow run and inspiration right so i took like I don't want to do, if I'm going to do all these different fantasy characters, I don't want to do a cyberpunk world because that's too close to Shadowrun. And I don't want to do the more traditional J.R.R. Tolkien creatures uh, and AD&D and, and &D creatures because that's too close to Shadowrun. So why don't I do um, uh, Greek, right? Uh, uh, Greek. Uh, mythological creatures and do steampunk. I like Victorian uh, science fiction, so why don't I do that? And you so know, I, instead I, of I love minotaurs and centaurs, you know, we yeah, yeah, and and right, like how come there aren't more centaurs in games? I love centaurs, what awesome! Right, right. <laughs> I, I I I grew up watching that old Hercules cartoon, um, I right, and and really enjoyed that, and 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 all those old you know stories and 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 that sort of stuff, and right, read a lot of those um, uh, old old right uh, Greek mythological stories and that, and so really enjoyed that. And so I said, okay, well, so then a troll in Shadowrun becomes a Minotaur and 
uh, you know, an orc in Shadowrun becomes a Cyclops and we still have dwarves and, uh, right, okay, we have humans and, and, and right, all that sort of stuff. And so, um, uh, right, and so, and elves become centaurs and okay, right, like now, now we've got a, you know, a fundamental basis for the world and, and, and the story that we're making. Um, and so I really saw our game as, if I can do Shadow Shadowrun Dragonfall, because that's my favorite of the three, right? I think the Shadowrun Returns is too short. Shadowrun Hong Kong is too long, and there's too much narrative in it for me. Um, Shadowrun Dragonfall, I think, is is a healthy balance for me. Of it's the right length, it's the right balance. In you know, there there's a few spots that are maybe a, a bit long winded, but it has a healthy balance for me of. The, the mission driven structure, the multiple paths to success, the branching narrative, the turn based tactical combat, super fun. Um, and so if I can make a game, right, it has the companion quests and the different companions that you can, you know, not you, there's no romance options, but like you can have, you can build your relationship with them and unlock the companion quests and things like that. And I said, if I can make a game like Shadowrun Dragonfall, but in the Sovereign Syndicate world, I'll be super happy with that. Like that's my dream game to go make. I hope that we get to make Sovereign Syndicate 2. And if we do, it's gonna be Shadowrun Dragonfall, but with more modern graphic fidelity and and cinematic um uh you know dialogue sequences and right facial rigging and animation, like you know, take the thaumaturge level of graphic fidelity, put it in a game like Shadowrun Dragonfall with the turn-based combat. That's what we'd love to do for for Sovereign Syndicate 2. That was my dream game to make. We just weren't confident that we would get enough money to make it. I just and so we so we ratings to Dragon uh, <laughs> Dragonfall from the uh, the critics. So wow, yeah. And so so we cut the you know the the turn based combat out because we said right it adds a lot of complexity. It adds a lot of cost. Um, well, I think you know I, I've been thinking about that because I teach a class and game studies and i try to find games for casual people and i, I typically don't put computer role-playing games on there just for that reason because then it, you know people spend so much time uh, trying to learn how to play this you know and really we're more concerned about the narrative anyway <laughs> you know so i'm thinking this game uh, sovereign syndicate would be a good choice because it is there's a lot of uh, literary value to it and there's role-playing mechanics in there so somebody that's played 5e or something would be fill at home with this uh and the story you know we could there's they could talk a lot about you know the the tropes and everything in here so i'm really leaning towards that uh oh, i'm thinking maybe even the switch you know you'd mentioned you might do a version for the the switch yeah, we're, we're, we're the in, sleeper hit there you know yeah we're in we're in early days there where we're making sure it'll run properly on the switch but we're working through that whole process right it takes time um, right. It's obviously it's uh, you know, right. Different hardware profiles and they have their own, you know, platforms and, and ways of doing things. And so there's a lot of work going into configuring the game to run properly on those uh, platforms. But it runs well on the Steam Deck. So we're hopeful that it'll run well on the Switch. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we we built a, a lot of what I find challenging about modern day RPGs is more on a personal level. Right, I'm in my early 40s, married with kids. I don't have as much time to play games as I'd like, and I certainly don't have as much time in one sitting. Um, you know, I might have some time in the evening after everybody goes to bed, or like right after I help the kids with the homework or whatever. Um, but it's really hard for me to sit for two, three, four hours at a time and play. And so we we naturally we built in. Um, game flow and break points where it was a natural stopping point right so we have the game divided into chapters which i thank you for provide doing. a natural stopping point where you can okay i'm gonna save stop and move on uh the game auto saves a ton so you can really walk away at any time um i found that when i was playing particularly when i was playing shadow run hong kong that if i had an hour to play Sometimes that entire hour would be getting ready for my next mission and talking because you want to go talk to every character back at the, the hub, 
because you don't want to miss anything. And so I would spend the entire hour talking to characters and I wouldn't get to do the mission. And I, that would be disappointing to me, right? It's like, okay, I, like I wanted to go. And then sometimes when you're out on the mission, you can be out in it for like two hours and it's because the, the turn-based combat has a tendency to drag sometimes. Uh -huh. um, and so you, you can get stuck in this turn-based combat where you can't save the game for like two hours at a time. And it's like, okay, we need to work around those problems because, I, right, like if I can't, if I don't enjoy playing it as much because of these game flow issues yeah. where, you know, how come I have to spend an hour or two talking to characters before I get to go on the mission? And then how come I can't save in the middle of the mission because I'm out in this really long combat sequence where I just, I can't save the game yeah, state. And so, I mean, it's just amazing that it's so badly done. <laughs> well, right. I mean, I mean, right. To be fair, those games are more, you know, 10 years old now. Um, but like, so, I, could, I could give the, I could assign this to my class and say, play, uh, I want you to play two chapters by, you know, next week. And then I'd have a really good idea about like how long that's going to take them to do, you know, how much, yeah. you know, time that would be whereas you know <laughs> these other games I, how do you even break it up in any anything that makes any kind of sense you know well play it yeah. for two hours well i don't think may, maybe they spend two hours look staring at the character creation <laughs> uh, yeah, so, something i don't know yeah one of the one of the the guys at um larry and said that about Baldur's gate three that like there's a certain percentage of their players that never get out of the character creator <laughs> But they spend like right. They'll, they'll play the game for a couple of hours, but it's all like playing Mr. Dress Up with their Potato Head, Mr. Potato Head creature, right? Like it's just they're just they're getting their character exactly the way they want it, right? Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven probably has the same problem where there's so many options to make your character exactly the way you want that it can take you a super long time. And so we avoided that uh, with Sovereign Syndicate because I wanted people to be able to just jump into gameplay, but our audience has now told us that that's one of the things they, they is they wish they had only one protagonist, where right we jump between the, the three or four. Um, and so, so we wanted to tell the story that way from multiple perspectives. We think that's that gives a lot of uh, dimension to our narrative and it's part of what we like about our game but for the next one we're going to let people create their own character and we won't go overboard with the character creation stuff right i, I don't want to spend a million dollars creating a character creator um, and allowing them to write manipulate every single you know option but giving a good number of customization ability you know a good amount of customization ability is what our audience is asking for. And so we'll do that. You'll be able to create your protagonist, um, pick from any of the races that are available in the game, uh, right? Pick your pick your sex, pick your skin color, pick all of your, right? Like your eye color and your hairstyle and all that stuff and create your character and name them and put the, and your class and your stats and put them in the world. We're going to do that next game because that's what people are asking for. Um, and that, right, that's what we wanted to make. It's just, again, it's like, that's, right, making a, a, making a character creator is a cost. Well, you you could spend... Options with this game. I mean, you got, what, the four sort of paths, I guess, you could yeah. choose for each, each of the characters. I, I kind of, I like the idea. Gives, to me, it gives a little variety, you know, okay, you, you played the dwarf for a while. <laughs> now you're back to the Minotaur. Now you're back to Clara. Yeah. Yeah, but right, like we, you people know, are right. you know, this is it's so subjective. Like the things I like, other people complain about. Yeah, <laughs> yeah have... right, hundred percent. Right, you have to when when you get feedback, right? It's it it's hard, right? You spend a long time working on a game. I did all of the marketing for the game myself, other than like reaching out to like Evolve PR and some right some public relations firms that just have a broader reach. Like Evolve did like some email blasts for us around key events. And like, we hired some companies to help us with our trailers and um, uh, evolved the key distribution for us, right? Giving out thousands of keys and then tracking who got what key and like, you know, all that sort of stuff. And um, so, right, that's that's work um, that, that it was easy for us to, right, contract out, but all the rest of it, all the 
Facebook ads and Reddit ads and all the comments and right like when if you interact with one of our social media things, that's me. I have done I have done every comment on every account for everything since we went public with it in July of 2021. Um, so so getting feedback from your audience is a bit of a double edged sword, right? Like you launch day for me was one of the most physically and emotionally exhausting days of my life because right you're you're up bright and early because you have to press that launch button at like 7 a.m our time 6 a.m pacific because like that's the best time to launch your game because you get like after work in europe you get the entire day in north america we're an english game so like that's our market so on launch day you want to be launched then so like so i'm up at like you know, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, get ready for the day, have some breakfast, sit at the computer, press launch. And then, you know, you sell, I think we sold 2,500 copies that first day and a bunch of reviews are dropping and you're getting a bunch of comments on all your social medias. And, and so you're responding to everything and you're keeping up with all your bug reports and stuff in your discussion boards. And, and, you know, you've got multiple platforms that you're on, you're watching your your Steam discussion boards, your Steam reviews, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Reddit, your right, like all the, the right, like it's just your Discord is going nuts. Like it was just absolutely overwhelming, but in a positive way for the most part. Um, right. People liked it. It reviewed well. It didn't sell as well as we wanted, but in general, the feedback was good. I can only imagine what Craig must have felt like in the same position, but with a game that didn't do as well, where the where the reviews came out and the scores were bad. And where, uh, right, this, this, it's your baby, you've taken care of it for years, and now you're putting it out into the world and it doesn't belong to you anymore. And, and whatever you think of it, that's not the prevailing opinion anymore. Um, and and so it it just sort of belongs to the world and they decide whether it's good. Um, I can still be proud of it, right? Craig and the team at, at Dropper Bytes can still be very proud of what they made, but we don't determine if it's good, the audience does. But when you get feedback, we were always very careful, right? Especially when, when we go to these in-person events too, where where I had my team, some people on my team were there helping me because it's a long day if you try and do that by yourself, right? You're on the floor at Gamescom for 12 hours a day or whatever, that's, that's rough. Um, uh, you have to be able to bucket your feedback, right? There's essentially four types of feedback that you can get about your game. Positive, hey, thank you so much. Your game is great. Thanks for telling us. This makes us feel good. It helps us lean more in the direction that we're going. There's feedback that is negative, but constructive, that helps us make decisions about, okay, right, they told us what they liked and didn't like about it. They were constructive about the negative. It helps us further define what we're making and make decisions about whether or not we agree with that feedback or not, right? Do we think that person's right or not? Should we change that or not? Um, is this feedback indicative of what your entire audience thinks or not? Is it just one person's opinion or is this symptomatic of what the entire audience is thinking? There's feedback that is negative for the sake of being negative right? Trolling, right? There are people who just for whatever reason want to try and drag you through the mud and who are just, there's there's no positive intent. There's no being constructive in their feedback. They're just being a jerk. And, and then there's feedback that is negative, but it tells you that your marketing messaging is wrong. Right. Generally, if somebody is unsatisfied with your product, you can you can hang that on. They ex the, the, you didn't meet their expectations, and you have to look back at why. 
what 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 created their expectations um right if you if you go to mcdonald's and for some reason in your head you thought you were going to mort steakhouse or some really high end steakhouse yeah. then even if it's good mcdonald's you're going to be disappointed because you expected steakhouse yeah um for for uh, broken roads, they delivered a game that was not in alignment with what they had sold the game as. Their audience expectations were a longer game, a more technically stable game, a uh, right more turn-based combat, better turn-based combat. The moral compass being more effectual in the gameplay. Right. They, they, you know, un, you know, uh, Craig's been very public about we thank you for your feedback. We know where we missed the mark. Here's what we're fixing to get the game up to the expectations that were set. Um, and so we tried to be very clear from the beginning what the what the game is that we're making, who it is for and who it's not for. Um, right. Our biggest inspiration is Disco Elysium. The combat is like Disco Elysium in that it's not really combat. It's not turn-based tactical. It's not uh, real time with pause. We use the comic panels. We have a demo up that has been up for years. That is this. This is the first chapter of the game. And if you like this, you will like the rest of the game. And if you don't like it, it's not for you. Yeah. And so, so we tried to set very realistic expectations in our audience's mind about what the game was. And still, um, right, that we got a, a Polish reviewer. Um, uh, I can't remember what outlet they're from, but it's on Metacritic. And they gave us like a five and a half out of 10, like, and just dragged us through the mud for like 10 pages. It's the most negative review we've gotten maybe ever. Um, and it's because he expected us to be more like Baldur's Gate 3. And I'm just like, I don't know where we set that expectation ever. It's obvious that he had that expectation of our game. Uh, he wanted us to be the next Arcanum or Baldur's Gate 3 or Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader or whatever. And so he just, because that was his expectation and we didn't live up to that, he just dragged us through the mud. And so, right, part of it is even when the feedback is super negative, we have to sort out, is it negative because this person is a jerk or is it negative because somehow our marketing messaging set an expectation in the customer's mind that we then didn't live up to? And so we have to be very careful when we market something, right? Look at um, No Man's Sky is probably the most famous example of a game that did that. They sold themselves as you're going to be able to fly to any planet and explore that planet. And it's totally seamless, no loading screens, and the universe is huge and blah, blah, blah. And then when the game came out, it absolutely did not do what they said. And then they worked on it to get it up to where it is today to deliver on what they said. And kudos to them for doing that. But they absolutely sold a product that did not exist um, in the way that they said. And so that's the like the 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 negative connotation in gaming media and in the gaming audience around selling hype. Right. Hype is fine if your game lives up to what you said and is what you said. Peter if it's if it's not then hype is a negative thing. Um, and so, so our job is to take all of the feedback we receive about the game and sort it into those buckets. Is it positive? We have found our audience. This person loves our game. Great. Good for them. We're going to continue to market to them. They're our biggest supporters. We just want them to go tell all their friends and all that stuff. That's awesome. Is it negative and we, you know, we need to internalize that feedback and decide whether or not we agree with them and whether or not we should change it. And 
you know, what does that mean for our future development plans and all that stuff? Hey, we're going to do a character creator. We're going to do turn-based combat, you know, more cinematic dialogue, voiceover. Those are the main points of feedback that we're hearing that we want to integrate into future games. We don't have the budget to do it for Sovereign Syndicate, but we will do it for future games because we realize how important that is to our audience because they've told us. Um, if the feedback is negative, why is it negative? Do we need to change our marketing messaging? Is it constructive negative or not? And then, right, like we, we're the arbiters of that. We're the ones who have to decide. It's not personal. The feedback isn't personal unless they're really trying to drag you and trying to make it personal. It can be, but it's our job to just throw that feedback out and go, yeah, okay, that person's a jerk. It doesn't matter. Um, uh, it's one person's opinion. Um, and, and so it's hard to hear all that feedback at the same time, but we have to be the arbiters of it. And, and to be the face of it, community management is super hard in that way. And so I hope to any other developers out there listening that, that we need to, you need that community manager, you need that buffer to protect your developers because it really upsets me when people drag the developers on a game. Because ultimately I was the producer, this is my project, I paid for it. And the buck stops with me. I made these decisions. I told the developers what to make. That yes, they provided their feedback. Yes, they provided their input. Yes, absolutely all of them have their fingerprints all over this game. And the game is a product of their inputs. And I am super blessed and lucky to have the team that I have. And they're fantastic. The game is what it is today in part because of them, in a large part today because of them. But at the end of the day, it's my game. It's, it was my idea. I made it. I made the key decisions to get rid of turn-based combat, to get rid of the character creator. Right? We, we didn't even build those things because we didn't right, get rid of, right? We chose not to build them. It's not like I took a character creator that we had and threw it away. We never made them. Um, but I, right, I made those decisions. The, the, the graphic fidelity, the level of graphic fidelity, um, we couldn't afford voiceover, so we didn't do it. We couldn't afford localization, so we didn't do it. All of those decisions ultimately rest with me. And so if somebody goes out there and drags our writers or our art team or our animators because they're not happy with that level of what we shipped, I don't blame them. I don't blame the developers. I blame me um, for failing to hit those, those watermarks because... Ultimately, I approved it. I played the game. Like I said, I played the game for probably 280 hours just in the five weeks before launch. Um, I am very intimately familiar with everything in our game. I have read every word. I have played every character, every scene. I've clicked on every item. I have I've done all this stuff. <laughs> and so if it got past me and made it into the game, then I intrinsically, I said, yep, this is okay. I'm okay with this. I'm going to ship it as is, and I'm going to live with the feedback. Um, and so, but at the same time, I probably shouldn't have been the community manager on launch day because, because the project is so close to me hmm. that I don't have a healthy level of separation. It was hard for me to hear the negative feedback. Yes, I right. I have to be professional. I have to take that feedback. I have to I have to put it into its buckets. I have to be the arbiter. I have to decide whether or not there there's any truth in that feedback or not. Um, and and but I wish that I had had somebody or I had got someone involved sooner. I ended up doing it after launch day and getting somebody on my team involved in doing that you know, basically taking all the feedback and put it in buckets for me and go, you know, Isaac, here's what we need to work on. Um, because, because in aggregate, there's just so much feedback that it's hard to hear. Um, when you're so close to the project, when you care about it so much. And that's why I say, like, I, I really feel for the team at Drop Bear Bites because I know how much I love Sovereign Syndicate. And I can only imagine that they love Broken Roads just as much. And so to hear that people didn't like it is really tough, really tough. And that's probably not a bad idea to have a separate uh, 
community manager you know i was just thinking about a lot, i've done a lot of interviews with game devs over the years as you could imagine i've never yeah, heard right. one i've don't, i'm trying to think I, I don't think so though i don't think i've ever heard one try to throw people under the bus there were you know if it's a producer for example i've never heard them try to throw somebody under the bus you know no matter what it was and that's one of the things i admire <laughs> you know about them for doing i have heard them say what well, was the publisher or it was the marketing people or it was you know uh, they tend to get the most flack you know <laughs> they came out with yeah, a terrible right. ad and i had nothing to do with this advertisement and i disavow the ad you know there's a lot of that kind of stuff but yeah you know, i'm throwing your own people because you know again it's they're they, they're the ones that made those decisions it's you know nobody yeah. else's fault yeah right i i you know i i hope that especially for people with a more traditional games background i hope that you only get to be a producer if you have that level of personal responsibility um uh, also, right, I can't, I can't blame, a, even if I wanted to, which I don't, I can't blame a publisher or a marketing agency because those things were me, right? I did, right? I didn't have a publisher. I didn't have a marketing agency. I did all those things. So, right, um, uh, right, I, you know, I, I have not heard Craig blame Tiny Build or Versus Evil or Team 17, all the publishers he got to work with or blame the localizers or any of that sort of stuff. But he right, he had those partners working with him and there are inherent challenges in working with other people, um, other companies to bring your game to market. Um, I, it, In some ways, I wish we had had that support because I think the game would have done a lot better um, if we had had more marketing from a organization that had more, uh, you know, a bigger audience. Right. If uh, you know, I look at how well we just we just finished bundling with the Thaumaturge from 11 bit and Fool's Theory. And that bundle did really well. And it did well in part because Thaumaturge is such a good game, but also because 11 bit is such a well respected publisher in our space and has such a large audience. Mm -hmm. And so I look back and I go, geez, if 11 bit had published Sovereign Syndicate and and, and would we be like the Thaumaturge today? Um, right? Would we be cross-platform and in eight languages? And would would we have sold probably 10 times the number of copies that we've sold today? Probably. And that's hard, hard to know um, that if we had been able to make a publishing deal like that work, we now in hindsight, we know we made a good game. We know people liked it. We didn't know that at the time. We didn't know how well it was going to sell. We obviously thought we were making the best game we could. We thought it was going to do well, but we didn't know for sure. Publishers didn't know for sure. So in hindsight, right, publishers didn't want to invest in it because mostly because there were so many words in it. Localization was so expensive and because there was no turn based combat in it or real time with pause or just combat in general. Um, so what I'm and, thinking and, is like if, if you had a publisher. You know, if one of those people had said, sure, you know, wouldn't you be giving up though a lot of your freedom? Your like a lot of the choices would be taken away, right? Somebody might say, Well, you're gonna put turn based combat in you're gonna you're gonna put turn based combat in it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Like we Would there be we, like a, a downside to it, right? Yeah, right. That's that's the old um David Brevik tells that story about the original Diablo game that they, they were but so before they were with Blizzard. I think they were called like Silicone and Synapse or something like that. And Diablo was a turn-based game. And when they were pitching it to publishers, Blizzard had just come out with the original Warcraft game and they were doing quite well. And so they were looking at publishing other games. And so Silicone and Synapse pitched to them and said, um, right, right, here's here's Diablo. And they and they you know sent them a prototype or whatever and they said yeah it's fun but and we'll publish it for you and here's how much money we'll give you but only if it's re if it's real time combat and not turn based and so they needed the money to do it and so they said okay but we want you know instead of this much money we want this much money and so uh, Blizzard said okay and so they they made it um, I cannot imagine Diablo as a turn based game anymore. Um, right, because it's just so iconic as a part of the experience, um, and such a pillar of the experience. So, so yes, I mean, right. Hopefully, if you're with a publisher, yes, they're putting money in, 
yes, that money should give them a say in your development if they want one. Um, but hopefully you're also signing with a publisher who knows what they're talking about and who has the, right? Like, you know, I would want to sign with a publisher like 11-Bit or like Hooded Horse or like Team 17 that makes games like ours, publishes games like ours, maybe has done some internal development like 11-Bit, right? Made, made their own games um, uh, that, that can talk to us one-to-one -one about what it is to make a game like this. It can help us navigate some of those challenges. Um, they have skin in the game too, right? They get paid by recoup. Um, so the better the game sells, the better we all do, um, right? Would I, would in hindsight, would I give up 30 or 50% of the game sales if it meant selling 10 times more copies? 100% all day I would, um, right? In hindsight, we didn't know. Nobody knew. The publishers were risk averse. They didn't want to take it on. Um, we, you know, I've never negotiated a publishing deal before. Um, you know, we were getting, you know, I put up 400 grand of my own money, Canadian. Canada Media Fund put up 1.1 million Canadian. If I have a publisher come to me and say, we'll give you $250,000 US, and sorry, this is an offer I actually got. I won't tell you who it was, but the offer I got was, we will give you $250,000 US uh, and we will market it. We will spend a hundred grand in marketing and we will put the game in Russian for you at launch. Um, but we want 100% of what the game makes until we get uh, twice our money back. Ooh. And so, right, so up front you get 250 grand cash in your pocket. Okay. We translate the game into Russian, which we knew would cost 60 grand US. So they're investing, you know, 310,000 in, in making the game a better game. And then they're investing a hundred grand in marketing. So they want to make sure they get all that money back and a, what they call a reasonable return on their investment before we see any more money. And I looked at that and I said, at the time, no thanks. Mm -hmm. In hindsight, I probably would have said yes. Huh. That was the best offer we got. Um, and in hindsight, I probably should have taken it because then I would have, I'd be almost debt free um, instead of sitting on significant development debt like I am now. The game would be in two of the largest languages that it would be in. Um, you know, it still wouldn't have done as well as it, right? If we had gotten a deal like, you know, Thaum Thaumaturge probably got from, from 11-bit. It wouldn't be that successful, but it would probably the game would probably be more successful than it is today, um, because we would also have gotten the extra marketing dollars. Um, and so, right at the time, I looked at that deal and I go, right, the government is putting up the Canadian government is putting up a million dollars. I was very, um, you know, I, I tried to treat that like my own money, right? I'm not trying to take advantage of it. That's that's Canadian taxpayers that put up that money, including me as a taxpayer. Um, and so I was very humble. Um, and I, I had a, you know, I felt a high degree of responsibility to make decisions that were in the best interest of how to spend those dollars effectively and how to get good value for money. And so I thought, you know, is that fair? Is that deal fair to me? And is it fair to the Canada Media Fund and ultimately to the taxpayer? Because Canada Media Fund gets 15% of all the money that the project makes. So 30% goes to Steam, 15% goes to the Canada Media Fund as their return on investment for, for putting money up towards the game, and we get the rest. So Steam, right, takes all your money in, pays the VAT, any taxes, right, um, uh, state taxes, anything like that, depending on where the game is selling. 
um, handles any refunds and chargebacks and all that sort of stuff. And then whatever's left over, they take 30%. They send us a, a wire transfer. We send uh, Canada Media Fund their share, and then we use the rest to do whatever we want. Uh, right, pay down debt, pay for future development, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, so I had to look at that and go, well, you know, okay, I get 250 grand US, but I owe Canada Media Fund 15% of that because they're not going to see any revenue until we're at, you know, 2x, which we may never, the game may never sell that well. This might be all the money I ever get from this game if I sign this deal. Um, I was because, thinking about the worst case scenario for this. Yeah, right. So we, right. So yeah, so right. Part of our job is do revenue modeling and go, okay, if the game sells, right. It, right. Craig was talking about that too, that, that Broken Roads performed you know, worse than a lot of their potential models showed that it could. Um, so yeah, so we had like a, it, we think it'll at least do this well. If it does modestly well, we think it'll be here. If it does really well, we think it'll be here based on how these other comparators did and, you know, um, how many wishes we have. And right, uh, you know, there's companies out there that track statistics about all that stuff, right? Um, uh, Simon Carlos and, and Game Discover Co. and Chris Zikowski and How to Market a Game. They have a lot of articles about how games are converting and how much money they think they're making. And right, there's like SteamDB and uh, Gamealytic and all these services that you can get into um, that, that track all that data. And so, right, you, you build a revenue model and you say, okay, right, if we sell 100,000 copies, over the next five years, how much money is that? When does the money come in? How much of it is when the game's discounted? How much is it discounted by? You know, people in the US pay a different amount for the game than people in China or Russia or Germany or whatever, right? Because there's Steam regional pricing. So, okay, what percentage of your sales are going to be in Canada, the US, Germany, Japan, South Korea, Russia, China, blah, 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 blah. How much money is that really in our pockets at the end of the day? And you have to model all that out. And that's what you use to base how much money are we willing to spend on this? And how much money do we think we're going to get back? And how much of it do you get in the first year versus the fifth year and all that stuff? And, you know, um, it's it's hard to know for sure. Um, you know, I think for this next game, this has taught me a lot. And for the next game, we're going to try and deliver on all those things that we talked about and we're going to pitch it to the right publishers and we're going to want to sign a publishing deal with the right publisher. And we're going to be more open to the value of the publisher's audience and the value of localization and porting, right? The value of audience and the potential for the audience to play it. Because if, if they, you know, having 20,000 Russian wish lists doesn't do me any good if the game's not in Russian, they're not going to play it and so if the difference between being in it it's almost like publisher money is a multiplier more than development money is because if the publisher is focused on audience maximization if they focus on let's make sure the game is on consoles and let's make sure that the game is in all these languages and then we'll market it if 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 getting publisher money is the difference between me being able to afford that or not, that money is a huge multiplier on how successful the game can be because it opens the door to audience that right now will not play our game. People who play, our, play their games in German, Polish, Chinese, Russian, Spanish, and French cannot play our game right now. So they won't buy it. People who only play their games on Xbox and PlayStation and Nintendo Switch cannot play our game right now. So if a publisher had come to us in hindsight with 250 grand or 500 grand for localization and porting, we would have recovered that money very easily in hindsight mm -hmm. because the game would have been able to sell five or 10 times as many copies. Well, 
well, Isaac, I don't want to trivialize any of the stuff we've been talking about here, but I, we got to at some point have to address that I haven't heard you mention when you were doing all this prediction work, going to a fortune teller <laughs> or breaking out the deck of tarot cards. <laughs> and we have to talk about the tarot cards somehow. I'm sorry, that's the best transition I could. No, it's all good. It's all good. Right? Like, you're right. I obviously, right, you're right. I have that business background and I love talking about the business of games. But you're right, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about the game itself. Um, geez, so, what? You could just, yeah, I just quickly would like to hear how the uh, story of the, how the tarot cards got into the game. Sure, sure. So... And then also the um, humans, which I think are really, really neat. Yeah, so so that was uh, a bit of a lightning bolt for me, I'll say. Um, I was trying to think about how to design the game. And we were, you know, in, in the absence of uh, turn-based combat, and leaning more towards Disco Elysium, we obviously took a lot of inspiration from Disco, not only in our initial des design decisions, but even in what the game is today, um, right? The, the dialogue panel being on that side of the screen in that format is something that Shadowrun did and Disco Elysium did. I think Disco Elysium gets more credit for it than Shadowrun does, but certainly Shadowrun did it first. Um, uh, and uh, Disco Elysium does the dice, where the they play that sound, that really addictive dice rolling sound, and then the dice pop up on the screen, and it flashes green or red, green if you were successful, red if you failed, and you get that like that clicking sound and that ding, and then the whatever it is plays out. And so we looked at that and we went, okay, well. Again, sort of like how when I created the world, I looked at Shadowrun and then changed it. I looked at Disco, exactly. I looked at Disco Elysium and went, okay, well, we don't want to use dice because that's too close to Disco. So what can I use? And one night I just, I couldn't sleep. And it was just like a lightning bolt in my head. Why don't I use tarot cards? Because it leans really well into the mysticism and the, the, the era, the Victorian era, um, and provides a sort of like a deck building element that we really like and satisfies the, the ability of having the dice. And from a visual design perspective, it's so beautiful and it's such a great hook to get people yeah. to pay attention to it, right? So it's a it's a Victorian right Sovereign Syndicate is a Victorian steampunk RPG with tarot cards instead of dice is our elevator pitch, and people love that when they see it they go tarot cards that's awesome. So many people look at that and go, right that's the hook, and then then instead of doing the animated sequences like this Elysium where you're I don't know breaking the door down or whatever and um, we I, right we're our our animation pipeline wasn't very good. Um, we had trouble executing animation to the to the level that we wanted, and so we did the comic panels. Um, so again, our initial dialogue panel when we were first designing it, uh, we used a thirty five millimeter film strip arrangement. So with the different cells, we had every bit of dialogue in like a film strip cell and we had like a, a film reel that was in this part of the screen. Um, and so when we did the comic panels, we went, why don't we lean into like silent the silent film era and do a like kind of like a, a silent film section. And it, that became these comic panels. I thought the comic panels are really cool. I almost wonder, they made me think, Maybe there's more you could even do with this, you know, focus in on this even more and make it more comic-y for lack of a better. Yeah. <laughs> a comic, yeah more like a living graphic novel kind of a thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Like we, these are, are there are uh, the illustrator that did this, Michael, um, he is a uh, children's book author and he does these like, and this is his art style. 
Um, and he does these layouts in his children's books. And so we just sort of took his talent and ability in his portfolio and went like, what would this look like in our game? Yeah. Um, and this is and this is what came out. And it's this is awesome. Ab absolutely beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can Fantastic. It would be cool. You know, maybe this starts and then at certain points you get the choices you can make and you have to make the choice and then you get a different panel here. Yeah. Or it yeah. could even just be rolling as you're going along and you could see, oh, I got that roll. So that panel pops up, you know, just some stuff I was thinking as I was playing this. But yeah, this is one of my favorite parts of the game because I, I really like graphic novels, like <laughs> comics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 me too. Like, me too. Yeah. And, and right, this is like you're saying, this is the virtue of necessity more than something that was originally planned. Well, well and and it it it's funny, right? We definitely started with a like, you know, not a let's clone Disco Elysium or Shadowrun, but let's take heavy inspiration from and then let our own design process and our own influences, you know, guide development and let the game take its course. And so there are certainly areas where we, you know, in our own style, forked off from what Shadowrun did or what Disco Elysium did. And I think there are a lot of what add character to our game, right? The tarot cards and the comic panels being two great examples. Um, I wish we had been able to afford to do more comic panels because once we started doing them, I really liked it. But again, from a budgetary perspective, um, we could only afford to do so many. And so we had to we had to step back and go, okay, right? We can afford to do, I don't know, a dozen of these or right, whatever it ended up being. And so let's pick the top 10 or 12 moments in the story where these would really add impact and then let's do them. And there are at least twice as many moments where I wish we could have done them, yeah. but where for budgetary reasons, we just couldn't afford to. Well, that's too bad. Well, <laughs> for, for the next game, for sure, because I think I think you're on to something with those. I mean, that was really, uh, really good. Let's see, do we have, I think we've really covered a lot of stuff. Uh, do you mind? few more questions just for the patreon folks yeah, yeah yeah i'm i'm happy to keep talking i'm I'm really having a good time so if you have more questions i'm happy to answer them yeah okay so i think i'll ask a few just for our patreon uh folks a little bonus content for uh, people that financially support the show <laughs> these will just yeah. be these are fun little questions and cool Wash. <laughs> don't drop it matt uh that's all for this week's episode hope you guys enjoyed that i got some really cool stuff coming up including an interview i have uh, ready now and by the great jordan mechner uh, so if you're a fan of prince of persia uh, karateka <laughs> uh, all uh, uh last express uh, i think it's going to be super duper uh fun interview uh so really looking forward to that and that's in the can uh, also, lots lots of uh, other Let's Plays I want to cover, lots of other games to get to. Uh, but I couldn't and would not do any of that stuff without you. So thank you very, very much for your support of the show. Uh, if you're not supporting the show, what what do I need to do? <laughs> uh, please support the show. I really need your help uh, to keep these episodes coming, uh, keep these interviews and all that. Uh, so if you want to see more, just take a few minutes, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page, become an official Ratron, and that'll get you access to the Discord and lots of bonus content, including more stuff from Isaac, uh, this interview that we uh, you just watched today. So if you want the full picture and you want to support the show, you want to be part of this team, this community, this cellar full of rats, uh, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon page. You'll be so happy that you did that <laughs> you know you want to just hey now go go pause come back i'll wait for you <laughs> all right so thank you for that it really does mean a lot to me guys thank you so much for supporting the show thank you all right what about those uh <laughs> what about that news <laughs> what about that news from the mad cave <laughs> Jeez, I kind of had a late night last night and went to see uh, Rift Tracks live. You know, they were here in Minneapolis. Even though they're from here, apparently they don't do too many live shows here. Uh, so that was it was kind of late getting back from that, but what a lot of fun. 
So I know a lot of you guys probably like Rift Tracks or MST3K, and all I can tell you is if you get a chance to see these guys live, don't hesitate. Uh, well, well worth it. A lot of fun. A lot of great people at these things, as you can imagine. Uh, all right, uh, Miko uh, writes in about Fallout London. Uh, you probably have talked about this uh, off and on here. Uh, I guess it started off maybe as a DLC or a mod, but it got a full treatment. Now it's on GOG and Steam. You, know, you do need to have the base game, Fallout 4 for this, Game of the Year uh, edition, I believe. Uh, lets you explore a disheveled London set in the Fallout universe. Overhaul, overhauls uh, Fallout 4 with a new story, new weapons, London-centric theme, vast recreation of the ruined city. Uh, so it's got a lot of good stuff going for it. Unfortunately, the early reviews indicate it's plagued with <laughs> crash-to-the-desktop level bugs. Uh, so you might want to wait a little while till those get ironed out. Don't know quite what's going on with that. Uh, but hey, if you've uh, played the game, uh, you got some thoughts to share on it, please do just go to those comments there and here on YouTube and uh, let us know what you think about the game. I'd love to hear that. Uh, second up, Pani uh, writes in about Trials of Tav, uh, a roguelike mode for Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, so it's pretty much a combat uh, system. I think you just have endless kind of an arena mode type deal. Uh, yeah, uh, the ultimate test of skill and strategy. Combat only mode lets you fight waves of enemies and progressively harder encounters. Doing so lets you random loot with rarity based drop rates as well as a rogue score, currently used to unlock powerful power ups. Doesn't require you to go through the tutorial, you just jump in and start the combat. So <laughs> I guess this is for people. Uh, if you just really like the combat uh, of Baldur's Gate 3 and you don't want any of the other stuff, uh, this might be for you. It's called uh, Trials of Tav, and there is a multiplayer version of this, uh, so I don't know. <laughs> I kind of like a little bit more than pure combat, uh, but it might certainly be fun for an afternoon or two. I don't know. Again, if you tried this out and you love it, let me know what you think. Uh, and then finally, uh, for you HP Lovecraft fans out there, there is a new game in that uh, world. It's called The Cthulhu Project, an upcoming dungeon crawler. For the Amiga, Commodore Amiga computer, best computer ever, in my humble opinion, uh, by Captain Dark N 3 m 0 Dark Enthermo. I <laughs> don't know how to say that exactly. Uh, anyway, apparently they've been working on this for a while. They've got some uh, progress to show. Uh, it's based on Eye of the Beholder, Lands of Lore, that kind of game. And let's see what else is here. Uh, the creator says it's being developed using Amos Pro as a 3D old school Dungeon Master-like game. Now, I remember Amos Pro. <laughs> if, you, if you had an Amiga back in the in the 90s, I remember that being a thing. Now, I always wanted to use, it looked like a pretty good system for making games. I never quite got around to it, but uh, that's, it's just so cool that people are you know, still delving into that. They haven't given up their dream. Uh, they got this new video up of uh, an updated dialogue system. But anyway, it looks pretty cool. I love that people are still making new stuff for the Amiga. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool, yeah, with Amos. <laughs> okay, uh, well, what about that ale of the week? Let's see what we got over here. And I've got one last, uh, one last uh, untitled art, uh, non-alcoholic beer. I'm gonna have to update my, my collection soon <laughs> to get some, I get some fresh brews for this segment. But uh, this one is called an Italian style Pils, of course, Pilsner. Uh, so it should taste something, uh, I guess, like a Budweiser. Uh, uh, some Coors, you know, something like that. Nothing wrong with those kinds of beers. Uh, it's not everybody. It's kind of, I always thought Pilsner is kind of like the default setting <laughs> for, for beer. So if you've only tried, you know, a couple of beers, it's probably the Pilsners. And it's not, you know, a lot of people like it. Some people hate it. Uh, so I always say, if you think you hate beer and all you've ever tried is a Pilsner, uh, you might want to try some of these different ones. Try a stout, you know, see what you think of that. Uh, maybe try an IPA. I, my guess is you probably, if you're anything like me, <laughs> you start off with the Pilsners, you fall in love with the Stouts, uh, you get into those darker ones for a while, and then gradually work your way up to uh, the IPAs, because uh, they can be kind of off-putting at first, kind of bitter, hoppy, not everybody likes that. Uh, or the Belgians, you know, some of those are kind of strong, uh, so some people might li not like those for the, for the strength. But uh, anyway, I'm curious about this Italian-style Pilsner. I'm not quite sure what they mean, what an Italian style means exactly when we're talking about Pilsners. Now, as usual, there's not a lot of uh, info on these cans from Untitled Art. I mean, it's a beautiful can design, but they don't tell us what kind of hops are in this. 
Now they do mention it has 40 calories, uh, so that's not, not a lot of calories for a beer. Uh, two grams of protein, apparently, and of course, no alcohol. And so what I love about these non-alcoholic beers, you know, if, you, if you're like me, you're, you're trying to exercise, get, get in shape, work out, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose a lot of times if after you work out, you're chugging <laughs> regular beer. <laughs> uh, but with something like this, you know, you get a little bit of protein, a uh, few calories, and of course, you don't have to worry about uh, hangovers or anything like that. Uh, but anyway, let's get this sucker open and see what it's all about. Okay, I'm going to open it up. We'll pour it here in the in a glass first so you can see what it looks like. Then we'll pour some in the horn. Ah, you know, it smells really, really good. You want to smell? Just going to take a sniff there. Smell it? <laughs> How many people actually sniffed? <laughs> you know, it doesn't smell much like a Pilsner. It smells more like an IPA to me. Definitely smell some hops in this. Uh, good color, good head on that. A little bit of a citrusy aroma to it. Smells really good. And I gotta say, really, uh, you can't always tell by the smell how it's gonna taste, but usually a pretty good indicator. If it smells really good, it probably tastes pretty good. Of course, sometimes they put in that artificial smell. <laughs> okay, is that a thing? I guess it's probably a thing, right? Let me give it a swig. What a good taste on this, too. You know, this doesn't really taste anything like what I was expecting. You know, I, I was expecting that sort of corn, wet, soggy corn flakes <laughs> uh, taste that you get with a lot of Pilsners, but uh, this is actually kind of hoppy, citrusy. Yeah, you can sort of have a, you, you can definitely tell it's got more, uh, for lack of a better way to say this, it's more watery, uh, better hydration, I guess you want to be positive about it, uh, than a regular beer would have, but uh, the taste is rather pleasant. Yeah, this is a pretty good one. I like this. I'll try some from the glass, because sometimes uh, this makes a difference to your drinking receptacle. Yeah, this is a pretty solid choice. You know, again, I I, can't, I feel like I'm just being repetitive at this point, but the uh, these guys have a a s'mores dark, uh, I think they call it, uh, non-alcoholic, which is just probably one of the best non-alcoholic beers I've ever had. All the other ones have been kind of less than that, so I don't know why you would choose another one over the dark s'mores <laughs> or the s'mores dark, whatever it is. But uh, this one's okay. You know, I was thinking that, you know, I've tried some of the big macro brews like the, uh, the Coors, uh, non-alcoholic, the Heineken, non-alcoholic, uh, the Guinness, non-alcoholic. You know, some of those big brews uh, make the best. It's not like a regular uh, craft brew where the craft brew is vastly superior to the major brands. Now, I think when you're talking about non-alcoholics, maybe they have better resources, better science, you know, whatever it is. Uh, they tend to be able to make their non-alcoholics taste more like their regular beers uh, than the crafters do for whatever reason. Uh, I've sort of noticed that with these. You know, I don't, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> uh, I, if, it, if you didn't care about the non-alcohol, if that wasn't a factor, I don't know why you would choose this over all the other Pilsners that are out there. Uh, but, you know, if you just, if you, if you, if you really want non-alcoholic stuff, <laughs> and you want a kind of an interesting pilsner, a little bit watery, I guess you can go for this one. You know, it's not bad, it's just, again, what I really like in it, what I want is a non-alcoholic beer that doesn't taste in any way inferior to the real thing. Right. Maybe even better tasting than the regular beer. You know, that's sort of the goal for me. <laughs> uh, with this one, you know, I think there's going to be a little bit of, well, okay. <laughs> so I don't know, I might go two, maybe three out of five stars if we limit it to uh, non-alcoholics. Of course, if we open it up to everything, I wouldn't give it very high marks, but kind of an unfair comparison. Uh, but anyway, not a bad choice. I wouldn't be devastated if somebody brought a six-pack of this over to the house, but 
wouldn't exactly be through the roof. I'd probably say, why didn't you get the dark s'mores like I asked you? <laughs> okay. Well, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And I was looking uh, for quotes from steampunk authors, you know, people who write steampunk, and apparently it's kind of debatable who wrote the first or what is, what's the first steampunk novel or story. Uh, but one that gets brought up a lot is a, a book called Titus Alone by Mervyn Peake. Uh, so I was kind of intrigued by this, and I was looking for quotes by Mervyn, and I found this one. It's pretty nice. It goes something like this. We are all imprisoned by the dictionary. We choose out of that vast paper-walled prison our convicts, the little black printed words, when in truth we need fresh sounds to utter new enfranchised, new enfranchised noises, new enfranchised noises, there we go, which would produce a new effect. So, dictionary bad, new enfranchised noises, which would produce a new effect good. <laughs> Very interesting thought there from Mervyn. Uh, didn't do full justice to the quotation, but hopefully that will give you some hint of the flavor of his work. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you guys next time. Then, as of this moment, they're on double secret probation. <laughs>